Our next speaker is another West Australian country boy. Uh, Matt Regan is the general manager of uh, corporate services from the CBH group. Uh, Matt's going to be talking about uh, how uh, growers can use some of the, the data that these uh, bulk handlers are uh, uh, accumulating um, uh, to their advantage. So welcome Matt to the stage. Thank you. Um, I'm going to actually also try a live demonstration, so no net, could go pear-shaped, but I'll just get it ready for a little bit later. Right, so let's get this going. Right, so this is the CBH group, this is our supply chain. So 4,200 odd grower members, uh, there's actually almost 10,000 individual farms inside that 4,200 grower members as well, but you can see we've got... Um, about 16 million tonnes last year and the year before and the year before we've had a run of really good crops and this year is looking like another one. So I know it's been a bit different over in the east but over in the west it's not been too bad. We've also got a large storage and handling network, 200 sites. Now we're actually just announced a network strategy where we're going to be focusing our attention on 100 sites only. Those 100 sites, they, um, they take about 90% of our grain. And I'll show you one of the key fundamental things that used all the data that we could get our hands on that helped us get to that decision as well. It's actually about 21 million tonnes worth of storage, but effective is about 15 as we start segregating on. So how you can use your data to start getting better segregations, you can start getting better storage um, outcomes as well. You see we've got uh, rail investment, we've got locom our own locomotives, we are one of the largest marketing and trading arms as well. We do a lot of grain outside of Western Australia. Uh, we also do a lot of our own shipping and we also have flour mills and in, in, in a flour up in uh, Asia and we've also recently bought um, Blue Lake Milling as well, an oat milling plant too. So that's the CBH group in a nutshell and that's our supply chain in a nutshell. But the, form, the most important thing for us is that we're here to cry, try and create value for the growers of Western Australia. We're still a cooperative, so it's a member-based cooperative. So the two things I'm going to talk about... Uh, the first one will be quality optimization, and that's a virtual grain blending system that we gave our growers five years ago. I'll talk about some of the values on it, but I'll also talk about some of the detail behind the scenes on that and how that product gave us the uh, confidence, I suppose, to then take on this supply chain optimization piece. And then I might touch on the next bits after that. But as we've all heard today, and I promise we didn't collude on this, processing of data that's going to drive the innovation, I think, in the next few years. Certainly from our perspective, the amount of data we've started to process and started to make sense of and the value that we find in it is going to create all sorts of opportunities. So there'll be more data available than ever, ever before, and it's only going to accelerate that amount of data. Transparency. So we just heard Nathan touch on transparency. Transparency is coming. It's, it's there, and it's driving different margins in different parts of the supply chain. And that transparency is also only going to accelerate. Okay, the data will require connection. So we're going to have data from all sorts of different places. So the bomb data, soil data, pricing data, you know, logistics data, all these things, they're going to need connecting. And, you know, that's, going to cr that's difficult to do. Unstructured data. So this is stuff that, you know, we might verbose right into uh, a field and a database. That will also need connecting. And there are, real, there are experts out there obviously doing this stuff right now and doing it well. But ultimately, creating meaningful action from that data is what's going to drive innovation and it will create opportunities. And it's the economic benefit that will come from that will drive innovation even further. But I suppose it's at this point we all talk about the opportunities that innovation will bring, but there are going to be winners and there are going to be losers in this journey as well. And we may well be one of those losers in it as the Airbnb and the Uber models of the world start connecting as well. But ultimately, certainly from CBH's perspective, it's all about what is the best outcome for the growers of Western Australia in particular. So, two real world examples, quality optimization. So, this is our virtual blending. So, for those that know or those that are in the game, growers can take you know, a grade of perhaps GP and they'll put it with a grade of a APW and hopefully it all comes out as APW and you deliver it to the bin and you get the best possible price for it. Common practice, takes a lot of time and effort, particularly when it's 40 degrees and the flies are everywhere. We wanted to allow the growers to use their storage and handling network in a much better way than they were, get more value out of it. So we provided a digital system to allow them to do that. 
Now, this may not make sense, but I'm going to show you this and how it works, okay? So it's a digital solution for a physical activity. And there's a whole bunch of activity that happens after they've delivered the grain to make that all work. But it was the simplicity of the digital system that made it, you know, I think, a success. Uh, it needed to be simple, but it also needed to process data really quickly. And when you start putting, we allow growers to split loads so they can go down to um, essentially 100 kilo lots. And when you do that, you create a, a very, very complicated problem. You know, when you're putting 30 tonnes together with another 30 tonnes, but you can split that into any decimal point along the way, you start to create complexity. There are rules. So for us, this is a bit of an older slide. We've APW1 now in the west as well. But essentially, you could take your grain from through the hard classes there. So I've got a little laser here. So, you know, clearly you get a higher price for H1 and all the way down the tree. You can blend grains from the hard varieties into the APW varieties. But for instance, you can't take a noodle class variety and blend it into a premium white. Now, when you start putting constraints around your data, you start creating computational issues. You have to calculate these things. Okay, so we had a vast set of complicated rules. Okay, we had eligibility. eligibility. It was a complicated thing. The growers knew practically how they did it on farm. How were they going to do it in the system? Tim, can we try and cut over now? So I'm going to show you how we... Hopefully I'll show you how we did this. So this is our load net platform. We a lot, you know, this is similar to a banking platform. And here's our load net optimizer, quality optimizer. I'll go to the training data so you can see. And essentially what you have is on the left, you have all of the delivered loads for any particular grower and some of the 32 odd parameters that might make up a particular load. Everyone see that? You can sort it in all sorts of different ways. We wanted to allow growers to do this very much like you would play solitaire. Okay, so the first thing you would do is you would create a bucket. We'll do it in the Quinana zone. We're starting to introduce it for barley, you can see. You create a bucket, you create that lot and then you can start to drag tons into it. So we'll take this GP load here and you would drag it across into there and you're starting to build up a weighted average for new grain that you would virtually blend. CBH would then obviously do that blending for you in the background. Oops, sorry. So we'll take a, another load of now APW2 with a lot higher protein there. And you can see I've now blended those two loads together and we've created, you know, $100 odd dollars. And that's all based on the price spread. So this is where somewhere with Nathan and, and CBH we could perhaps work and getting true transparency on pricing. So really what's happened there is we've virtually blended. We've now got two loads that will inherit the same overarching parameters. And the first year we put this out, the growers beat us. We had an automatic method of doing this, and the growers beat us every single time. They could do this better than we could do it. So we developed some uh, algorithms for that. And you can see there's heaps and heaps of stuff to play around with here. You know, this particular training grower, he's got a lot of grain. And they could spend all day doing that. So we created these auto buttons. And this is what this does. You can do it by price or quality. We're starting to play around with can you blend it to different contracts and stuff like that. This is where you can split the loads. We'll let it split loads just to see. And auto-optimise. After that first year that we put this out, we knew we had to get this bit right. If we had to give the growers a chance to auto-optimise, we wanted to make sure it was right. So what we did was we ran three different algorithms, and they're doing this now. They're competing in the background. One is a linear algorithm. One is an evolutionary algorithm and one is an ant colony algorithm. And we generated that stuff and that goes away and it finds the best combination of loads to give you, in this case, we wanted the best price outcome. And there you go, you can see it's created, I think it's three lots by memory, four. So it's added all those, those um, tons of grain together to make these four lots. They will all inherit the weighted average of the lot they're in and you can see the value that's created. Tim, can we go back now, mate? Thanks. 
So they're the three algorithms we had to produce. We had to do that to give the growers confidence that we were giving them the best result. The second year we put this out, we got only a handful of people that were able to beat it. I'm sure they spent all night doing this. But after year three and four, we got confidence in the system and it was able to produce a result. Now, this is now five years old QO and it has generated, that little green symbol you saw in the top right hand corner, has generated $150 million for the growers of Western Australia. Now that is a, a transfer, if you like, of the arbitrage value from the marketplace to the grower, but because we're a cooperative and we're about the growers, that's why we did this. Now the marketplace weren't that happy with it, but it also creates a transparency in the market. Okay, it certainly flattens it there too. More than that though, more than eight hours of on-farm effort was saved. So in the first year, growers still did the blending on farm. They still wanted to, and I can understand that. Year two, there was a little bit less, and year three, really, it, and it saved on, on the, our receival points as well about going back around and retesting, because if you knew you had a quality bank, you could get that grain through. So I demonstrate this because it's a unique blend of a physical problem that you can use a digital solution for, but you need grunt in the back end. So outside of season, it just sits in a computer in our um, head office over in Perth, but in season, we have to farm that processing power out to the internet, out to the cloud. In this case, it's the Azure cloud because it gets complicated really quickly. So we talk about data, but ultimately, data takes processing. So the second thing I want to talk about now is supply chain optimization. So here you can see the goal. Um, based on the back of you know, what we did with um, quality optimization, we wanted to now go through and look at how can we use the sort of learnings and the technology that we found in this space and apply it to our network of 200 sites and four ports. But the key point here is it was from paddock to port. So our grower based um, board members, they wanted us to unlock as much value as we could throughout the supply chain, but they wanted it from paddock to port. How can we start to unlock value? So obviously this is more in freight for the growers. How can we minimise their freight bill from their farm through to our receiver points, but through the entire network as well. This is a mock-up of what it looks like for us. We've got marketers on the other side of us, and we've also got end users that we, we've got in our supply chain. So at one end, you've got growers. You've got the 10,000-odd grower farms. You've got all our 102 different receiver points, all with different capacities and conveyor belts and grid speeds and queue lengths out the door and different RAV ratings for roads to get into them. We combined all that data into this supply chain model. Okay. We also had, you know, we had, we had the benefit of the grower deliveries over time. So we had an opportunity we could do this. We also had what we might do. So we had to build the model in such a way that we could release it to make better decisions. So if we built more capacity or we built a bigger grid at a particular site, how would that improve the model? And ultimately, the marketplace is the people that are actually footing the bill for the grain at the end of the day. We had to make sure we we're providing services to them as well. So this is the model. This is the complexity of the model. And I just want to make sure everyone's aware as we talk about data and data being the next thing, it takes a lot of processing power to do this stuff. You can see here there's more than 220 million variables in this particular model and we aggregated it. So what does that mean? We took three or four farms and we aggregated them together. We would take lanes out so we wouldn't allow Lake King to deliver to Geraldton because it was impractical, it would never happen. Now in a real model, you would let that happen because you never know. But we took those sort of things out. So we aggregated it down to 220 million variables, not to mention all the constraints we started to run it into. And you can see there, we ran more than 1,500 of these models. Over and over and over again, you know, releasing it to do this, releasing it to do that. We want the cheapest freight price for the grower at the expense of CBH. We want the most grain we can put on rail, for instance, how much can we limit the amount of CO2? We did all those sort of things with this model. Okay? In the end, we started off with Amazon cloud computing. And at the time, we were starting to run out of computing power. So this was only three years ago. And we ended up moving to uh, the Azure cloud. I'm sure Amazon could do it today, as Google could as well. But three terabytes of RAM in these high-end servers that we can't get our hands on. You know, five years ago, you couldn't use these machines. Now, you can pay for some time on this stuff. And it would still run for between 24 hours to five days to produce a result. The result was something in the order of $80 million worth of annual savings split between the grower freight bill, which was, I think it was about $30 million bucks, and the CBH maintenance bill and the CBH on, um, operational cost and freight bill. So that's the kind of savings you can find from this stuff, but it took five days for a model to run to find that result. 
This is what it looked like. This is a graphical representation, if you like. You can see, I always like looking at the orange one there. So that's someone's farm. You have to clean this data. You have to make sure it makes sense to you. So we ultimately ran a, sigmoid, uh, a centroid function here that put a little dot more or less in between the farm. We actually had access to obviously all the paddocks as well. We could have done paddock deport, but the processing of the data at the end of the day was just too complicated for the machines at the time. But one day, one day we'll be able to go to paddock to port, someone will be able to unlock that, and growers will have in their hand the best decision making tool ever. But someone's got to get all that data and pull it together and give them real time access to that decision making. And I would suggest that's still several years away. But it is coming and it will take all of us to get to it. And it will create a better economic outcome for all the participants that ultimately win in that game. But there will be losers. So when you start to strip away the farms, you've still got your little centroids. You can see there we've got road and rail and a mix. So the growers are travelling on road. We've got rail. We've got different rail loading and all that sort of other stuff. So you can choose it to, you know, only buy rail. So once the growers have given us the grain, let's maximise the rail. You can do it only by road. I had another one with only by road. You can do the mix. You can put the RAV ratings in there. We had the RAV ratings. So, you know, how big a truck can come into a particular site. We were talking before with somebody, this is the sort of data that you could use with the governments and the shires about, well, these are the roads that need upgrading and these are the ones that don't. And this stuff is, you know, you got this on your Google phone. I walked from the airport here last night and I just had Google to show me the way. So the data's there and it's available. It also allows you to do other things. So we, I've obviously left um, the 2012-13 season off. We used that to, to prove the system was working. But you can see we had a rain impact in uh, Western Australia that year. And you can see the receivables just fall off the chart. That has lost value for growers. And this is the power of the data. And if you can improve throughput and getting grain off farm quickly or getting grain into a, a safe location, you can save and create value for growers right there. Because then it slows things down with falling number machines and all that sort of stuff. And this is now just showing in a, a local site. Not too far from you, Nathan, there. So Again, a lot more localised on the rain issue there. And that has cost growers money. And that's what we worry about. How can we help create more value for the growers? So this gives you just an idea of what it looks like practically. You know, you have grain being drawn from all over the place. And ultimately, you can tidy these networks up and focus your spend in the right areas. And you can create real value throughout an entire supply chain. Now, we could only get from the farm gate to our end users, but one day, one day people will be getting this stuff churning in the background and you'll be able to make decisions on the fly. So I just wanted to give two practical examples of how I think data will drive digital innovation. Okay, so back to those points originally, there's going to be more and more data than ever before, but it's going to take processing of that data to unlock opportunity. And ultimately, from, from where I sit at least, it's the economic opportunities that that data will provide that will drive the next round of innovation. And as many winners as there are in this room today from that, I can tell you there'll be lumps and losers as well, unfortunately, but there'll be new industries that will open up from that as well. And that's it.